In August of 1929, a team of prospectors from the Dominion Explorers Company, led by Colonel C.D.H. McAlpine, set out by airplane to survey for copper in what is now the territory of Nunavut. After losing one of their aircraft to Tidewaters in Churchill, Manitoba, the expedition waited one week for a replacement before continuing north. The supply ship Morso, which was carrying additional fuel for the expedition, accidentally caught fire and sank before delivering its cargo. Facing a combination of bad weather and navigation issues, the crew ran short on fuel and was forced to land at Dees Point, a distance of approximately 85 miles by foot from Cambridge Bay. There was no radio on board and no way to send a message of their location. After the team failed to report in, news of the lost expedition spread throughout the fledgling northern aviation industry. 18 aircraft and their crews took up the challenge, including well-known bush pilots Andy Cruikshank and Punch Dickens. Some of the aircraft were placed in supporting roles, such as fuel supply runs. One of these was Fokker Super Universal CFAAM. And for this airplane, this was to be the first of many adventures. This is the incredible true story of legendary Fokker CFAAM, from its first flight to its untimely end, and the team that brought it back to life. By the late 1920s, the growing dependability of air travel drew the attention of William Rowe Archibald, the manager of mines for the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company of Canada, later Cominco. He realized that an airplane could take his men into remote prospects within hours, compared to months of overland and canoe travel. For him and countless others, airplanes provided the best possible option to open up the wilds of Western Canada. Clannell Hagerston Dickens, best known in Canadian aviation history as Punch Dickens, was one such advocate. As one of the first pilots for Western Canada Airways, he pioneered the first airmail circuits across the Prairie Provinces before turning his eye to the north. Piloting his instantly recognizable Fokker Super Universal, he completed one of the first aerial surveys of Canada in 1928. According to RCMP officer Stallworthy, who accompanied Punch on one such flight, it took exactly 58 minutes to cross the 17 portages between Stony Rapids and the height of land. Here, Punch explains what it was like to fly that airplane. I would say that for the horsepower we had available, the net horsepower, having a fixed pitch prop, and all this sort of thing, and the payload that this craft would carry and the average speed it would cruise at 95 on floats and about 105 on wheels and and about average about 100 on skis back in trail William Archibald created an aviation department so he could in his words get there first with the best Mr. Archibald decided to have his own airline yeah. because the men in the fields weren't getting the supplies or anything, so he just started up a little school over in one of the lakes, asked all the pilots who were in the first war would they please sign on if they were interested. So seven of them signed on, and Ken was one of them. Local boy Ken Dewar was hired to fly one of Consolidated Mining's freighters. Ken was an accountant, and he couldn't go to war. He was too young. Ken's dad was a great friend of Consolidated Mining and Smelting, top man, and they used to write. So Dad Dewar mentioned he had a couple of smart boys, he just wrote them and said, send them out, we'll look after them. Just like Punch Dickens, his was to be a brand new Fokker Super Universal, registration CFAAM. Pilot Dewar and engineer Bob Niven were very proud of their state-of-the-art aircraft, which featured an optional electric starter and Hamilton floats. Here, they and their families pose for photos with the newly delivered airplane. AAM was stationed at the CMS base in Sioux Lookout, Northern Ontario. Merle Dewar describes her living conditions during this time. I was in a tent, 
what oh. about this house? He's gone, you see. And I've asked for this manse, because they said, oh, the manse is new, and it's going to be where the preacher lived, but his manse is ready now. So you were first, so he got me this little cottage. And I moved all my uh, worldly goods, which were very few, in a blizzard. I had no phones, and I waited for, uh, I don't think it was 10 weeks, in that little house. Mere months after taking delivery of AAM, they received word that the McAlpine expedition had gone missing near the Arctic coast. Ken Dewar and Bob Niven, as well as support pilot Paige McPhee, took part in the search. Ken was ferrying gasoline to where they could search again. There would be a supply depot here, a supply depot here, and this is the way they flew. They took turns in flying gas in, then he'd mm -hmm. go on in the search as soon as they got enough stuff, he and the other boys. This footage, shot by support pilot Paige McPhee, is the only known footage of AAM during the time of the search. As winter approached, AAM was swapped over to skis and resumed operations. The pilots faced unpredictable weather and vast distances, with little or no support, in an area that was largely unmapped. Five aircraft were lost or damaged during the search, each one worth about $22,000 at a time when a Ford car cost two hundred and seventy-five. Then, on November 4, 1929, Colonel McAlpine and his team, assisted by a group of local Inuit hunters, arrived in Cambridge Bay, having traveled the 85-mile distance by foot. The radio-equipped Hudson's Bay Company ship Bay Maud was wintered there, and they alerted the world. On the first week of December, four airplanes, including CFAAM, arrived in Winnipeg carrying the members of the McAlpine expedition. They were given a hero's welcome, including a grand party at the Fort Garry Hotel. When Ken got back from the McAlpine search, I was to meet him in Winnipeg with his clothes and such, you see. Well, we were all in the Fort Garry together, and you can imagine, there was a whole floor with reserve for us, and the pilots and their wives were all invited. And it was really something. This brought to an end what had become the most extensive aerial search in Canadian history. Although the elements had taken their toll on the expedition, the pilots, and the aircraft, not a single life was lost. Following the successful rescue, AAM and her crew were transferred to Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, then on to the Paw, Manitoba. On September 15, 1930, disaster struck. Dewar was returning to the Paw in the evening when his engine cut out unexpectedly. Unable to make the water, Dewar picked the next best spot, a nearby stubble field. The floats were torn from the frame and the Fokker flipped onto its back. Dewar and the passengers emerged shaken and bruised but otherwise uninjured. That night, Merle Dewar noticed her husband's boots making a strange clomping. Upon further examination, she found that both heels were missing from impacting the rudder pedals. And I heard this clump, clump coming down from way down. I could hear it. And he'd lost one, both heels of his shoes. Although the aircraft had been significantly damaged, an order was sent from Consolidated Mining's headquarters send the Fokker back to the trail shops for repairs. And for the first time, AAM would rise from the ashes.